nobody cares. <laughs> Have you ever heard someone say that before? Have you ever heard someone say that before about a church? Maybe you've said it before or perhaps at least thought it. It's one of the main reasons why people leave a church. And I get it. It's easy to come Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and feel disconnected from others, from the people around you. Nobody knows my name. Nobody knows what I'm going through, that I'm maybe going through a divorce or maybe my children are getting in trouble constantly at school and I don't know what to do about it. Nobody bothers to ask me how I'm doing. No one reached out, called me, visited me, and the list goes on and on. Here at Faith, we hope that no one would ever be able to say that, that no one would ever walk away uh, from our church being able to say this. The way we seek to counteract this is what I'm talking all about today. Through this series, we've attempted to explore the, ex uh, the advantages of Christian community um, and what it can bring to us. It's a community, or at least it should be a community, like no other on the planet. And I absolutely love what we're talking about today because it's so very near and dear to my own heart, my own personal experience. I'm extraordinarily thankful for this aspect. So let me start by saying this. You could not have gotten to where you're at without the help of others along the way. That's a truism. It's a truism that the modern man, the modern woman may have a hard time with at times swallowing it, but it's true. No matter how independent-minded, self-reliant, self-sufficient uh, you may be, think you are, you can't deny this. You didn't get to where you are right now by yourself. You required the help and care of others along the way. It's true in all of life. If you grew up as a child, that would be all of you. You were reliant, you're dependent upon the care, the care and help of your parents that they provided you. You couldn't have made it without them. You were dependent upon every single morsel that they fed to you. Um, I'll bet you have a story to tell. No doubt you have caregivers in your life, maybe not just your parents, who've helped you along the way, given you skills, encouraged you. They were a shoulder to cry on. Maybe they helped you with a down payment for a car or a mortgage payment. Uh, in my home, mom was the main caregiver, but every once in a while, dad would come through. I remember when I was in grammar school trying to learn long division, you know, the kind of math that the big kids were doing, and, and dad was sitting there on the living room floor uh, in his rather gruff manner trying to drill it into my thick skull how to do long division. You know, carry the two, carry, you know, whatever. And then I remember years later, Dad talking to me uh, out in the parking lot, taking me to a parking lot to parallel park. If there was an Olympic sport of parallel parking, I would win that uh, hands down. Uh, I can do it perfectly now. Years later, uh, father, my own being a father of three, barely able to rub two nickels together early on in ministry. Dad would periodically send us a check in the mail. And we'd know it immediately because um, after coming away from the mailbox um, in the little envelope, we'd check to see there's a paper clip and the paper clip always came with a check attached to it. Um, you'd feel the paper clip and you'd realize dad came through once again. There were so many times that the amount on the check was the amount that we were short. And though my dad, he wasn't a Christian, uh, God used him. Dad got us through those early years. Uh, in a monetary way. He gave monetary care and help uh, back then. He didn't even know how much God used him. So, so here's what's amazing to me, what I came to realize. Now, if an imperfect earthly father could give care, uh, kindness to his own child, however lacking, insufficient it might have been, however, however troubled, tough he was, how much more would an infinitely loving Heavenly Father care for one of his own children. So here's what's absolutely fascinating about Christianity to me. What I'm about to tell you rests at the heart of Christianity. At the heart of Christianity is this idea that God came down to us to care directly for us. He didn't send a messenger, an email, a telegram. He didn't sit behind a desk up in heaven. 
God came down. It's the core of our faith. Jesus came into this world to take the guesswork out of God and to be our ultimate caregiver to bring us the love of God in a tangible and personal way. The Apostle John writes this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. John, he's the gospel writer here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He was prior, prior to knowing Jesus, he was kind of, he's the salty fisherman who when Jesus first called him as a disciple, come follow me, he left his nets behind, followed Jesus and believed. But then just as quickly as John believed, John disbelieved after the cross and unfollowed Jesus, all the disciples did. But then three days later, upon coming to the empty tomb and seeing the grave clothes that no longer covered the body of his dead Messiah, the text says, and John believed. And after that, there was no turning back for John. And he went everywhere and anywhere throughout the Roman Empire preaching the good news that Jesus was alive and that he could save us from our sin. And the Roman Empire quickly got tired of that and Emperor Domitian arrested him, exiled John to the island of Patmos. And while there, he had lots of time on his hands to write the gospel account, letters as well, and the book of Revelation, the book of future things to come. And John said this, that he's, he's now, he's an old man, probably outlived all the other apostles thinking back over his time with Jesus, reflecting upon this teacher of, of uh, his, who he realized was more than just mere, a mere teacher. This was his conclusion. What did, he, what did he write? We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. So years after the fact, John is still convinced that his Messiah was more than a mere man, more than a good teacher, more than a prophet, but was in fact God in human form. We have seen his glory. That, my friends, changes everything. John was convinced that Jesus was God in human form. And John's gospel uniquely declares all of the many claims of Jesus. So what we learn in this gospel is that John's gospel is written to an audience who want to know about this Jesus, who this Jesus claimed to be. John's desire is that we believe his testimony of what he saw, what he heard. And here is what we learn. This is what we learn. Jesus didn't claim to be a representative of God. Jesus claimed to be the representation of God. Other religious leaders throughout time told their followers about God. They postulated, pontificated about their theories of God. They came to teach about God, but Jesus came to be God, God in the flesh, walking around in our midst. And one thing became very apparent early as Jesus dwelled among us was something that challenged the prevailing notions about God in Jesus' day. And it blew their minds. Look at what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You've memorized that as a kid, I'm sure. Maybe some of you have. This is the essence of the gospel right here. This is the good news. If there's one sentence that sums up the message of John's gospel, it's John 3.16. This verse tells us in plain and simple terms that the heart of who God was and what God was, what God was like, as Jesus came into the world, he showed this to the world. He came into de demonstrating the love of God. And in, in demonstrating who God was like, Jesus demonstrates whom God liked. For God so loved the world. Jesus came pouring out love and care to everyone. His love was limitless. Now, now this name may not be that amazing to you, right? You've heard it before, but it was startling to the first century people that God is love, that God loves everyone, that everyone matters to God, that God cares for everyone. No doubt you've heard it before, but, and we take this for granted, but the first century people didn't have a clue about this. This is not a first century notion. You see, it was shocking to both Jew and Gentile alike. You know, this idea that God is love, it's uniquely Christian. The Greek and Roman gods toyed with people, manipulated them for their own benefit. And along comes Jesus who shows a kind of care and compassion for everyone that simply blows the minds of first century people and disrupts their preconceived notions about 
God and about whom God loved. You see, in their thinking, the gods didn't care and they didn't require people to care. In the Roman world, the gods were selfish. And if, if they favored anyone, they favored the rich and the popular, not the poor and the destitute. If things were going well for you, you know, up and to the right, the gods were shining down upon you, blessing you. But if things were going not so good for you, you know, a string of bad luck, illness, job loss, the gods weren't with you and you were most certainly experiencing their disfavor. No one possessed intrinsic value, was worthy of the favor of the gods. Everyone in the first century was just one tragedy, one economic disaster, one heartbreak away from the punishment of the gods. And along comes Jesus, subverting all of that and introducing the world to the true nature, the true character of God, a God who cares. Jesus demonstrated clearly and abundantly that God not only loves everyone, but cares for the needs of everyone. That God pours out his blessings upon all people of every race, whether they follow him or not, whether they pay homage to him or not, whether they worship him or not. God loves. This is a brand new idea. And even in Jewish culture, the religious people of the day had so twisted the Old Testament to make it seem that Yahweh, God, only liked the good, upright, the righteous Jewish people and hated everybody else. They had their own version of karma by using their Jewish laws to keep women, slaves, the poor, the sick, the Samaritans, shepherds, run-of-the-mill sinners in their place. The God favored only the prosperous and the powerful. Illness and poverty were signs of God's disfavor upon you. You got what you deserved. Then along came the rabbi from Galilee and he flips the script and he elevates the dignity of everyone he touches, illustrating a kind of kindness that the world had never seen before. He taught and modeled a lifestyle that gave the impression that compassion was the highest virtue one could attain to. Not a weakness, but a strength. It was a sign of virtue that you cared for someone who could never pay you back or do it for you. And giving of yourself to others, sacrificing yourself for others was the way of Jesus. His teaching and his actions were equivalent to his care and kindness. When, when you look at the teachings of Jesus alongside of the actions of Jesus, it all demonstrates this care and compassion like never before. In fact, if you want to know, right, if you want to know what someone means, what they say, watch what they do. His teaching about compassion was demonstrated by his real and active compassion. I mean, let's just look one, at one, one illustration. The story of the Good Samaritan. That illustration, that parable, whereby we understand who our neighbor is and whom I should care for, or care about. And it's solidified in Jesus' care and compassion. And it illustrated, was marvelously illustrated in John chapter 4, his loving the Samaritan woman. He didn't have to reach out in love and grace towards her, but he did. Jesus went on to demonstrate that kind of kindness and care to all kinds of people who were far from God. He went out of his way to declare the value of those who in that day had no value. And the night before the crucifixion, in the upper room, Jesus declared the mind-boggling command to the disciples, a new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. There are a hundred times in the Bible where the word one another is used. And Jesus didn't give here a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. It's a commandment, a requirement. Did you ever have a dream that you were back in high school? or college, and you didn't pass in an important book report, or you failed a test, or you forgot to show up for class all semester long, and then, then at the end of the semester, you realize you're not going to graduate. About once a week, literally, I have this dream about not attending all semester long Professor Bressler's American literature class and not being able to graduate from college. And then I wake up in this cold sweat, only to realize I'm 62 years old and 40 years past my college graduation. <laughs> Just as you cannot graduate from college without a passing grade in, say, American literature, 
You cannot live the Christian life without a commitment to loving other people, period. And Jesus ultimately showed his love for us by sacrificing himself on a cross, dying for our sin. And that whosoever should believe on him, believe, trust in that payment for sin, shall not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel of Jesus, that's it. It's that simple, that we trust we receive by faith the, faith the grace offered to us by Jesus dying for us on the cross. You become a Christian when you say yes to that simple truth. And then you begin to follow him. And after the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, you know, when Jesus left the planet, his earliest followers don't miss this. They got it. They got it. The early church picked up right where Jesus left off. It was a brand new community with a brand new ethic. Love one another as you have been loved by Jesus. Simple. In Acts chapter 4, the history book of the early church, it says this. All the believers, all the believers were, to, were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, all that there were no needy persons among them. How radical this community was from any other community on the face of the planet. They saw one another's needs and they felt a responsibility for those needs. It was unthinkable to them that some would have little while others possessed a lot and thus they spread the wealth around so that there was not a needy person in their midst. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own. A perspective that was more than about, more about stewardship than about personal ownership. It was a lifestyle that was willing to just give of one's possessions for the sake of others around them. And, you know, we're not talking about communism or socialism here. Even though Karl Marx used these verses to defend his views. He, he, I'm always amused when someone who is an agnostic, uses the Bible as his proof text. Um, in the early church, it was just voluntary generosity based on sacrifice. As I have loved you, love one another. If Jesus' death is the model of God's eternal grace, then his dying love for me ought to be my example, the example I use for living for others. It goes way beyond sympathy that is marked by emotions. Not only, but rather empathy. Christian care, uh, which is much more of a muscular, active world, word for it. Jesus felt sympathy for the crowds. He looked upon them as sheep without a shepherd, but his care for them went far beyond emotion. He cared for their needs. It was the model of self-sacrifice. So contrast that with the spirit of the age. Not very much our, like our own age and where it's heading, promoted by a philosophy of Hate first, ask questions later. Be skeptical, be critical, be focused on self. It's what modern philosophers would call the spirit of narcissism. The American Psychiatric Association says that narcissism is marked by three essential features. First of all, it's a pattern of grandiosity, which refers to an unrealistic sense of superiority of, over others. Hypersensitivity, which is, you know, getting bent out of shape easily. And above all, a lack of empathy towards others in need. Sound familiar? How different was the New Testament community from that? Do you know what was one of the very first problems in the church? Uh, too much love. I kid you not. In Acts chapter 6, the apostles, Peter, James, John, Thomas, the others, <clears throat> they were spending too much of their time on the poor. They couldn't wrestle Peter and the others away from spending time with the widows and the orphans, making sure that everybody had enough food to eat. It was determined that some were getting ignored, and rather than let this continue on, it was determined that the disciples needed to focus on preaching and teaching and prayer, and others would be given the task of care and compassion to the entire community. These were probably the first deacons of the church, servants whose job it was to minister care on behalf of others. They had to pry it out of the hands of the apostles. Why? Because after being with Jesus for three and a half years, who ministered, Jesus ministered to everyone, healed everyone, washed their dirty feet, they got it. 
So this, a no strings attached, unconditional care and compassion became the hallmark of the early church. It's one of the best untold stories of the early church because they did not fear death when plagues hit cities. It was the Christians who entered, went back into the cities. So while everyone was vacating as quickly as possible, it's the Christians who went in and took care of the sick and dying, putting themselves in harm's way and often perishing along with the rest of the plague infested citizens. In the Roman Empire, it was not illegal to kill your own child if you no longer wanted them. Sounds strange to us today. If they were not useful, especially if it was a girl, you could take that newborn baby and leave them on the trash heap of the, the, the town. Perfectly legitimate. But it was the Christians who felt differently and would go to those town dumps and would rescue those abandoned children and raise them as their very own, even though they barely had enough to survive on and feed their own children. Why? It's because they took seriously the words of Jesus, love one another as I have loved you. Think about it. The first hospitals were created by Christians. The, the first orphanages were created by Christians. And when slavery, get this, when slavery needed to be abolished, it was the Christians like Harriet Tubman, William Wilberforce, Frederick Douglass, Charles Finney, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who refused to be quiet. There was a famous preacher, Charles Spurgeon, over 100 years ago, who preached vehemently against slavery and called it the foulest blot on society. See, what I can't figure out is this. Why wouldn't everyone want to be a Christian? The conscience of our nation has been shaped by the teachings and life of Jesus. The reason there is any concern and care for the poor, disenfranchised today in our nation, is not because we're inherently good people and we came up with that notion on our own, but because our nation has been molded and shaped by the scriptures. Because long ago, 200 years ago or more, our founding fathers forged an idea, the right of every person to pursue life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. That fundamental dignity for all mankind is a carryover, a leftover from the life ministry and teaching of Jesus. It's the basis of our nation to care for others. Thus, the ministry of the church is to be a holy reminder. Though our personal and corporate, through, through all of our personal corporate behavior, that everyone, everyone is precious in the sight of God. Now, while we may be attacked for what we believe, we should, we, might, we should be applauded for how much we care. Because that's the pattern. That's the model that our Savior left us right there. The way that we do this around here, around this church, the kind of all hands on, all skate is through what we call our small group ministry. Is there anyone here that doesn't need encouragement? Is there anyone here listening right now? that at some point in your need, you don't need support, care, or compassion. Repeatedly in the New Testament, care and compassion happened within these tightly woven Christian communities known as house churches. A healthy small group in a church, in my opinion, is the very best place for the kindness and care that Jesus demonstrated. I'm one person. And even if I could care for all the needs in this congregation, my question would be, should I? When we one another, one another, together corporately, we demonstrate to the world what Jesus is all about. It's powerful. So let me put it to you straight here. That the DNA of our church is more than just sitting in a row on Sunday morning because circles are better than rows. There are things that happen face to face that could never happen shoulder to shoulder. We're committed to being a shoulder to shoulder church, but we want to be face to face more. Rows don't knows. I know it's bad grammar. Uh, because in a row, hearts don't show. That's what it's all about. The care and compassion that we might not get on Sunday morning can be felt in a home or in a room or on a circle, a circle of caring individuals. It's where I can begin to open up and let you see my hurt, my sorrow my pain, my grief, even my joys. It's where I get to share my concerns about my chi children, my grandchildren, my job, my neighborhood. You know, my 2012 Chrysler uh, that's about to bite the dust. 
Everything in my life, I get to share with my circle. You can't one another your bro from a row, okay? You know, a spirit-enabled ministry of one another that happens in a small group usually produces a sense of joy and enthusiasm being with the people who have now become trusted friends and confidants. My needs start to get met. In a small group, I get to care and be cared for. Man, it's a pretty good deal. There is this marvelous give and take. Do you, do you know what I love to see happen? I love this. I love it when a small group leader beats me to the hospital, hospital of one of his small group members. I love it. Praise the Lord. I don't even have to be there. The ministry of care belongs to everyone in the entire church. And we experience it best through small groups. Here's what we know about community. It works. Three years ago, get this, in 2018, a study was conducted in Somerset, England. There had been a dramatic drop in emergency hospital admissions in the past several years, past five years. And they wanted to find out why. So the medical breakthrough was so astonishing, they found this, that back in 2013, a general practitioner had teamed up with a community health worker and they had started the Compassionate Project, a project with one initiative, enfold and engage people into community. Nothing more, nothing less. And in five years, although the population of that town increased by 30%, hospital admissions dropped by 15%. In other words, chronic loneliness and isolation was replaced by caring and compassionate connections. They realized that the power of community to create health was far greater than any physician, clinic, or hospital could provide. Community works. We were made to love and be loved by others. This is one of the primary purposes that we have in life. One day your life isn't going to work. Your life will eventually unravel. Trust me on this one. It will happen to you. You'll need a 3 a.m. friend. One day you're going to need their help. One day you're going to be broken down in the breakdown lane of life and you're going to need a friend. So the year was 1985. Joanne and I were traveling down 3A, Route 3A in Quincy, uh, pulling behind us, pulling behind our Chevy Malibu station wagon. Here it is right here. Uh, all of our worldly possessions in a U-Haul trailer. We were moving from Weymouth to Dorchester to be a little closer to her work, my school. When suddenly in the middle of this busy intersection right here in the middle of Quincy, the trailer pulled the hitch and the bumper right off of our car. And there we were stuck in the middle of the intersection during the busiest part of the day, backing traffic up probably for miles. And a part of me, you know what? Part of me just wanted to leave the trailer right there in the middle of the intersection and just keep right on going. You know, I can get new furniture. So who do you call? Who do you call when you've got nowhere else to turn? I called members of my community group, my small group, and they sprang into action. They rescued us with a vehicle to pull the trailer and we wired the bumper back in place and just went on our merry way. That's what Christian community can provide. Jesus has left us a model through his teaching, through what he demonstrated, this one another kind of ministry to one another. That's the basis of real Christian community that we one another each other in a circle. Jesus came to show real care and compassion. He displayed that ultimately on the cross by dying in our place. And he now expects that same level, that same measure of care and compassion to be lived out in Christian community. Around here happens best through our small group ministry. I urge you to take this next step, this step of faith. We're having here uh, at our in-person service on September 10th, what we call Group Link. It's your opportunity to get plugged into a community of other believers. You can register that day for that, uh, for that group that best fits your schedule, proximity, um, stage of life. I wanna challenge you today to, to take this bold step and see how God can use this in your life to grow and mature you and with that care and be cared for by others. So scan this QR code to learn more. Also sign up. Hope to see you there. Thanks for listening. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for the amazing care that you've provided to us. God, we cannot make it through this life without you. 
And we thank you for walking with us and uh, shining down and blessing us with your grace, mercy, and love. And Father, we know that we're in this world to be a blessing to others, to care, provide care for others. So God, we pray for just a, a growth in our small group ministry here. I pray for every person who's listening today that, it, that it'll rest upon their own heart, that they'll be convinced kind of deep within how much they need a community where they can one another each other. And God, we just want to keep on modeling the love of Christ around here, and especially in these small groups. Thank you so much for uh, this privilege today to be together and to listen to these things. We uh, pray that you'll just inspire us all. It's in the name of Jesus we pray today. Amen. Thank you for listening, everyone. God bless you.